Hello. Today in this series on an approach to symptoms, I'm discussing the syndrome of failure to thrive. For clarity, this will be specifically focused on adults. The term failure to thrive has a different connotation in newborns and children and a very different differential diagnosis in workup. I also want to preface this topic by explicitly pointing out that my approach and even my definition differs from one that you might find in an academic paper. For me as a hospitalist, the syndrome of failure to thrive is primarily one of a diagnostic dilemma. So a patient who is presenting to the emergency room with obvious progression of their known metastatic cancer or, no, or known dementia, they might fulfill some objective criteria of failure to thrive, but that's not the same thing as someone brought to the ER with the same symptoms, but without an established etiology. That's the focus here when the clinician does not immediately know what's going on. Not all clinicians agree with the term uh, failure to thrive, which we'll come back to about midway through the video. With all of that out of the way, how do I define the term failure to thrive? I see it as referring to a nonspecific syndrome of global functional and physical decline over a subacute time course without a specific localizing symptom or an overtly obvious explanation from the patient's history. The cutoff for what's considered subacute here is arbitrary. It's a duration of illness long enough that conventionally acute illnesses are not plausible, such as shock, acute decompensated heart failure, acute kidney injury, and typical bacterial infections, among countless others. But it's also a duration of illness too short to be attributed to simple age-related decline. The syndrome is most commonly observed in elderly patients with pre-existing chronic illness, but it can also happen to anyone, irrespective of their baseline state of health. Not all failure to thrive looks the same. There are overlapping subtypes based on the predominant manifestation. These are not official categories, but in my experience, and this syndrome is very much within my usual scope of practice, the five primary manifestations are as follows. Decreased activity, meaning the individual is doing less stuff than they used to. They are going out of their home less often, or if they live in an assisted living facility, they are leaving their room less often, eating in, uh, eating in rather than in shared spaces. Next is fatigue, sometimes described by patients and families as decreased energy. This sometimes manifests as decreased tolerance of activity, such that they are fine moving around their room, but can't muster the energy necessary to go to the grocery store or to a doctor's appointment. It is distinct from objective muscle weakness or shortness of breath with exertion. Cognitive decline, which is most typically poor short-term memory, but also a decreased ability to do tasks like manage personal finances and plan meals. Self-neglect, as manifested by either a decreased ability or decreased interest in bathing, grooming, and personal hygiene. And last is weight loss, often accompanied by poor appetite, and which is often associated with objective signs of malnutrition on physical exam and labs. Patients can present with any combination of these five core symptoms, although if presenting with only one of them, it might be best to frame the presentation around that one symptom rather than around a more global failure to thrive. Additional symptoms that frequently occur in this syndrome include insomnia, excessive daytime sleepiness, malaise, general weakness, anxiety, and depressed mood. For those not familiar with the symptom of malaise, it refers to the vague sense of feeling unwell that most of us have experienced briefly at least once during viral illnesses like influenza or COVID. The combination of all of the above leads to progressive disability, which can become a positive feedback cycle in which decreased activity and fatigue leads to deconditioning. And a decreased ability to buy and prepare food contributes to weight loss and malnutrition which then in turn can lead to cognitive decline and self-neglect. It's all related. And superimposed on all this is the influence of caregiver fatigue and burnout, which can color the family's description of a patient's symptoms and the timeline involved. Symptoms that are not typically prominent features of the failure to thrive syndrome include fever, night sweats, dyspnea, and pain that is well localized. By well localized, I don't mean isolated to one particular spot necessarily, but rather if a patient reports pain and the clinician asks, where is the pain located? 
the patient can identify one or more very specific locations on their body, whereas when pain occurs in patients with failure to thrive, it is more typically a vague, diffuse, achy kind of pain, more similar to the symptom of malaise. If a patient's presentation has a prominence of one of these symptoms, I would take a closer look specifically at that particular symptom. Very critically, failure to thrive is not a diagnosis any more than chest pain, dyspnea, or altered mental status are diagnoses. It's a presentation or a syndrome. So it's perfectly fine for a patient's one-liner on day one of a hospital chart to read something like, Ms. Jones is an 85-year-old woman presenting with failure to thrive, but the further along in the workup, the more specific one should be during rounds and in documentation. Giving in-hospital sign-out to a colleague by stating something like, Ms. Lee's 80-year-old uh, woman with fear to thrive awaiting dispo, is sabotaging that colleague's clinical reasoning by shutting it down before it even starts. Recognition that a patient has the failure to thrive syndrome is at the very beginning of the diagnostic reasoning process, not at the end. Likewise, it's almost never acceptable to list failure to thrive as a discharge diagnosis. The only exception would be if the patient's workup was stopped early because of a change in their goals of care. This gets to why some clinicians object to the very use of the term failure to thrive, that it's both vague and is seen as encouraging the clinician to not attempt to understand a patient's true underlying problem. But I don't think those critics object to the term as much as to the term's inappropriate use as a final diagnosis. And while some critics suggest completely abandoning the term and instead always more specifically describing what the patient is presenting with, similar to my criticisms of the problematic term altered mental status, I think with failure to thrive, that creates its own problem. Consider as an analogy the concept of sepsis. Sepsis is the presence of life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. If a person presents to the ER with sepsis, one could state something like, Ms. Martinez is presenting with fever, tachypnea, flushed skin, and signs of dehydration, such as skin tenting and elevated creatinine, in the setting of suspected infection. Now, in some ways, that would be much more specific than Ms. Martinez is presenting with sepsis of unknown source. But in other ways, it's almost less specific, or at the very least, is missing the bigger picture. In the sepsis syndrome, there is additional pathophysiology going on under the surface than just fever, tachypnea, and dehydration. And patients have a worse prognosis than the presence of fever, tachypnea, and dehydration would suggest. It is important for the clinician to recognize this in order to properly triage and manage that kind of patient. This is very similar to failure to thrive. Reporting that an elderly, chronically ill patient is presenting with confusion, fatigue, and decreased activity, but not acknowledging the presence of a more unifying syndrome of failure to thrive, is missing the forest for the trees, and is underappreciating the impact this condition will have on the patient's long-term prognosis. Failure to thrive is sometimes confused with the state of frailty. Frailty is a natural age-related, slowly progressive decline in nutrition, strength, and functional status that happens to most individuals if they live long enough. Failure to thrive is the more severe, relatively more acute, pathologic version of frailty. Frailty can be a precursor to failure to thrive, but the distinction is not always clear. When it comes to a diagnostic framework, if you've watched other videos in this series, you've probably become familiar with tables that look like this. Possible diagnoses for a presenting symptom, organized by organ system, which are then sometimes further subdivided. Unfortunately, because the syndrome of failure to thrive encompasses a variety of different symptoms, it doesn't neatly lend itself to an analogous type of framework. Possible diagnoses are just as easily given as a big list. But let me break it down into the relatively common versus relatively uncommon causes of this syndrome. And as I emphasized at the beginning of the video, this distinction of common versus uncommon is with the assumption that the cause of failure to thrive in the individual is not overtly obvious. Relatively common etiologies include progression of any previously established chronic illness, the severity of which has just been underappreciated. It also includes dementia, 
occult malignancy, depression and or bereavement, meaning a profound sense of loss following the death of a loved one, and relatively common metabolic causes include undiagnosed chronic kidney disease that's progressed to the point of causing uremia or electrolyte abnormalities, hypothyroidism, and iron deficiency. The relatively uncommon etiologies of failure to thrive include a number of other metabolic derangements, including hyper- and hyponatremia and hypercalcemia, poorly controlled diabetes, low testosterone, and chronic adrenal insufficiency. Also included are the many etiologies of anemia, which can also present with dyspnea on exertion, MECFS, which can often be distinguished from other diagnoses here by the relatively specific symptom of post-exertional malaise, in which affected patients feel generally ill after reaching a specific and usually relatively low threshold of physical or mental exertion. Post-acute COVID syndrome, which can look similar to MECFS in some patients. A variety of medications and toxins, including the phenomenon of polypharmacy, in which a patient is on a large number of medications, any one of which in isolation would not be problematic, but the sum total becomes so due to additive side effects or because one medication interferes with the metabolism of another. And last are chronic infections such as HIV, EBV, tuberculosis, and subacute endocarditis. While thorough, this list of possible etiologies should not be considered complete. When you're evaluating a patient with failure to thrive, you should start with characterizing the specific manifestations. Because failure to thrive is usually a gradually progressive illness, it can be helpful to ask what specifically brought them in to the clinic or the hospital today. Sometimes it's something arbitrary, like this is the day their child could get off from work to drive them, or a family member had not seen them for a few weeks and then popped by their home and was shocked by the decline uh, in between those two times. But other times, you learn something about the severity of the illness, like today was the first day that the patient could not dress themselves, or it was the first day that the patient no longer had enough energy to leave their room. Assess the patient's dietary history and quantify the weight loss, which means both how much and over what time span. Keep in mind that unless they are deliberately tracking their weight with a scale, people are notoriously inaccurate with estimating changes in weight. I've had patients tell me they've lost 30 pounds when a series of clinic notes have recorded a loss of only 10 pounds, and vice versa, saying they've lost 10 pounds, but in fact it's been 30. Assess the patient's ability to perform their activities of daily living, like bathing, toileting, and eating, as well as their ability to perform these so-called instrumental activities of daily living, like buying groceries, cleaning their home, and managing their medications. Take a thorough medical and psychiatric history, a thorough medication history. A detailed social history is important, both to figure out the diagnosis, as well as establish how much support they have and to start planning an approach to managing the patient. For example, figuring out if this patient is safe to return to their current environment. This includes substance use history, living situation, financial resources, social support, if they have experienced recent loss, and assess whether there is possible mistreatment and neglect. And last, while I'm not typically a fan of a thorough, unfocused review of systems, for most patients, failure to thrive is one presentation in which it is valuable. Moving on from the history, in addition to the vitals, you want to perform a complete physical exam, though calling it complete is an exaggeration since that would take hours. But in lieu of that, perform a relatively thorough head-to-toe exam. As with the review of systems, this presentation is one which warrants a more thorough exam than typical. Although not always thought of as part of the physical exam per se, this does include a dementia screen such as the MOCA or Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and a depression screen, of which there are several to choose from. Another useful test, not for diagnosis, but for understanding severity and prognosis, is called the up and go test. For this test, ask the patient to rise from a seated position, not using their arms, walk 10 feet, turn around, and then return to the chair to sit. 
a normal time to complete the test is considered to be 10 seconds. When it comes to diagnostic tests, it's really easy to overdo it and order far more than justifiable. Test ordering should be primarily gu guided by distinctive key features in the history and by the presence of abnormal exam findings. In the absence of those, the only lab tests that are commonly helpful are a CBC, primarily to screen for anemia, basic metabolic panel and calcium to screen for electrolyte disorders and renal insufficiency, TSH to screen for hypothyroidism, a hemoglobin A1C to screen for diabetes, and a nutrition assessment, which might include albumin, vitamin D, B12, folate, and an iron panel. You will see other clinicians order all kinds of additional tests here, including ESR and CRP looking for general inflammation, full liver function tests looking for hepatitis or cirrhosis, urinalysis looking for who knows what, SPEP and UPEP looking for multiple myeloma, hepatitis serologies, blood cultures, EBV and Lyme titers, RPR to look for neurosyphilis, etc., etc. Ad nauseum. Unless you have a reason to be concerned about a specific one of those problems, these additional tests are low yield and not cost effective. Can cirrhosis cause failure to thrive? Sure, but a patient with severe enough cirrhosis to present with failure to thrive will have evidence of cirrhosis on their physical exam. Same for any of the other conditions, these additional tests are intended to identify. There are a few exceptions as other tests to consider. HIV screen if the patient has risk factors, and chest imaging if the patient has prominent weight loss and or a significant smoking history. Whether to order a chest x-ray or a chest CT depends on resources, pretest probability for lung cancer, and whether the combination of the patient's age and smoking history would qualify them for a screening chest CT irrespective of their symptoms. The key takeaway points of the video. Failure to thrive is a nonspecific syndrome of global functional and physical decline over a subacute time course without a specific localizing symptom or an overtly obvious explanation from history. The syndrome of failure to thrive consists of some combination of decreased activity, fatigue, cognitive decline, self-neglect, and weight loss. It is not a specific diagnosis and should not be treated as such. Malnutrition, generalized weakness, and disability commonly coexist. And relatively common causes include underappreciated progression of an established chronic disease, dementia, occult malignancy, depression, chronic kidney disease, hypothyroidism, and iron deficiency.